Thank you very much. I do appreciate your earlier handout that detailed some of these issues for us, and I appreciate you preparing something that will help us summarize uh, and kind of shape the target. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your service. Now we'd like to hear from the Lake County School Board, Diane Cornegate, the superintendent. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Mostly just to say thank you. Thank you for your support of the students of Lake County. Thank you for the education appropriation of 500,000 used to open a construction academy at Eustis High School this year. The program opened with 110 students, which is tremendous for our first year program. The success of the construction academy at Leesburg High School, which was the result of a prior year appropriation of 866,000, was instrumental in generating student interest and community support for the new program at Eustis High. The funding has been used to purchase technology, equipment, and supplies to provide the students hands-on skills training in carpentry, masonry, masonry, electrical, and plumbing that will lead to industry certifications and high-wage jobs in our area. The Academy at Leesburg High School has grown from 35 to 125 students, and currently, Students are building a home in Leesburg with Habitat for Humanity. It's your continued support of our workforce development programs that will ensure that our students are graduating ready for college and in the workforce. In addition, your support to amend Florida Statute 1006.22 has opened up access to all of our career and technical education programs for our students across the county by allowing us to transport students to the programs of their choosing using more affordable vehicles rather than an expensive yellow school bus. As we continue to grow our workforce development programs, I will ask you this year to support an appropriation to begin an HVAC program at Umatilla High School in partnership with Lake Technical, Lake Technical College. This appropriation will allow students to participate in workforce dual enrollment through Lake Tech and meet a local workforce need for skilled labor in the field of HVAC. As you may know, Lake County Public School student funding ranks 61st out of 67 in Florida, Florida school districts. Lake County Schools has funded $457 per student less than the state average. Last year, the legislators allocated an additional $52.82 .52 per student to the Lake County School District in the total funds compression allocation. And I want to say thank you for supporting that allocation. However, the appropriation was only approved for one year and only makes up 25% of the funds below the 2018-2019 state average. We would like to make it a legislative priority to have the total funds compression increased to bring our district up to 100% of the state average and make the appropriation a permanent part of the Florida Education Funding Program. This can be accomplished by increasing the current required local effort school and Valorum tax rate to the 2018 level of 4.308 mills in order to generate revenue for this purpose or maintain the required local effort millage rate at the current level and use all revenue above the rollback rate each year to fully compress all districts below the state average. Lastly, I am very encouraged by the commitment of our governor and other state leaders to invest in Florida's public education by increasing teacher salaries. This can best be accomplished by eliminating bonus programs like the best and brightest and redirecting the appropriation to the base student allocation, giving districts the best flexibility to be sure that our staff professionals and all instructional personnel are included and help us to remain competitive in our efforts to recruit and retain truly the very best and brightest for our students. Thank you again for your time and for all your support. Thank you very much and I just want to thank you for fully embracing this marriage of bringing the ladder of the world of work and the world of education and academics together closer and I really want to thank the members of this delegation that have worked very hard to make that happen and you fully embrace that. Also, thank you for acknowledging uh, the compression dollars that we are going to continue to work very hard on fairness. Uh, district cost differential is another factor that can hurt us that we're keeping an eye on. And uh, we've got a great channel in education in the Florida House that knows this county best of all. And we, we will continue in the struggle. And uh, thank you for and the results that you produced both in people going to work and uh, also uh, graduation rates crack continually improving and those are all signs of a great dedication for your team. Uh, I was with some of the teachers um, in a program down at the uh, UCF, the Knights group and 
what a bunch of innovators. I mean, they're excited and they're coming up ways to get across and it was a very positive kind of um, intentional culture that they're building. And I know that comes from your leadership and the leadership of your board. I, I just want to thank you. And yes, we will try to continue to improve our fair share. Thank you. Next, we will hear from the Lake County Water Authority, Amy Stone, as chairman. Would you please come share with us? Um, I really appreciate the time to come in front of you. Uh, we've met over the last year, and, and one of the subjects that we've been very uh, adamant about and looking for is help with the hydrilla that we've had in, in Lake County. In the last year, we did um, allocate, in the last fiscal year, um, one and a half million dollars towards um, treating the hydrilla in the local lake systems. It seems to have been very effective, and we just want to make sure that we don't lose sight of the fact that hydrilla will come back. It's just not going forever. Um, so we're, uh, we're hoping that we can make sure that FWC is properly funded next year for this. Um, they're the ones that have responsibility to control that. We just assisted in this last year because, as you well know, we're, we don't have a big budget. We can't continually do that. Um, so that's, that's our first um, Point. And then we also wanted to support the Lake County Board of Commissioners, their priority asking that we uh, ensure sufficient funds for the, F oh, that, that's this, the FWC budget to adequately control the hydrilla, but also um, the funding for the advanced septic treatment, as you know, that affects our, our local waterways. And so if we can um, get that support, that would be great. And finally, um, we are sending letters to each of you supporting the Trout Lake Nature Center's legislative request. To obtain, to obtain the funding to continue their um, improvements in the educational complex expansions. Um, and I won't waste any more of your time, but I really appreciate uh, allowing me to come up and, and talk to you, and I'm always available if anybody wants to discuss any points. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I also want to thank you for working closely with our other Mary County partners so that, you know, we're all singing on the same song sheet. It, it seems to come together a lot better and we have a much better chance of accomplishing some of these things. So I appreciate, I appreciate you collaborating with the other local leaders, uh, your unique objectives. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next we'll hear from the City of Claremont, Darren Gray, City Manager. Will not be here. An emergency came up, so we excuse Darren. Uh, city of Brooklyn, my kind city manager, you're recognized. Mr. Chair, representatives, uh, our best senator started with, with gratitude. My kind city manager of Brooklyn, uh, does this mean I get to ask on behalf of Gary? And the city of <laughs> I'm super excited. Okay. Much has Hopefully changed. You collaborated. <laughs> well, you'll see in your packet a resolution from the city of Claremont. Uh, supporting one of our most important projects, the most go. important project. Uh, a lot has changed since I appeared before you a year ago at the City of Groveman. We have a new brand, a new logo, the City of Natural Charm. We're trying to implement that and enthuse that through everything we do. Uh, we've broken ground on three significant projects, specifically two park projects, the rehabilitation of Lake David, a new 40-acre regional park at Wilson Lake Parkway, all with local funds, as well as program on our new public safety facility. So we're putting local resources to enhance the community, serve the public, and partner with our regional partners. We also received a SAFER grant to support nine new firefighters. We'll open a new station. Uh, we saw Kroger and Ocado announced Groveland as their home. So the new regional distribution center, which will feature robotics and distribution throughout Florida, uh, adding 400 jobs and stimulating about $65 million of local economic activity in the region. Uh, we are in the process of redesignating our future land use to accommodate and enhance uh, a more sensible approach to growth, uh, as well as celebrating our natural resources and um, to signify some of the change in Groveland, we had our first uncontested election in what Senator Hayes said is the 
uh, only time he can recall in recent history. What hasn't changed necessarily is we haven't broken ground on State Route 50. And I appreciate the Chairwoman's comments about that as one of Lee County's um, legislative priorities. Uh, last year, I remember Senator Baxley asking, well, what are the other jurisdictions? How do they feel about this project? Show the overlap and the interests with other jurisdictions. Well, in your packets, you have resolutions of support from the MPO, the Lake County Board of Commissioners, uh, our fellow jurisdictions, Tavares, uh, and some of our partners sitting in the audience behind me, uh, Mascot, Mineola, and jurisdictions indicating that they wish this project to move forward. We have had some progress, though. The city has put funds forth in starting the appraisal process on some of the property, and we were recently informed that the state is looking at transferring $7.5 million in their programming to start some acquisition of the right away so that we can move forward on that project. Um, so, the city of Groveland will not be asking for a specific earmark or any specific language with funds towards State Route 50. Last legislative session, you may recall, we were enthusiastic supporters of the north-south corridors. We will ask for more of the same, but for east-west corridors and enhancement and investment in strategic infrastructure and other things to support and enhance commerce, which funds the great heart of the state. Um, again, thank you on behalf of the City of Groveland for all of your offices and your efforts to get FDOT to pay proper attention to this statewide um, issue of the realignment. I'll be happy at any time to speak to any of you or your staff about any project in Groveland. And again, thank you for your service. Thank you. And that, that, that has been very strong in my mind. It is a real linchpin, a linchpin to the regional traffic patterns, and, and I thank you for being on top of it and what you do. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, we'll recognize the city of Mascot, Jim Lewison, city manager. After that, I'll be recognizing Pat Kelly, the mayor of Mineola. Yes, sir, you're right. Nice. Chairman, uh, late delegation, Jim Lewison, city manager of Mascot. I've been the city manager of Mascot a little over eight and a half years, and this is the first time I have come to the local delegation on behalf of the city uh, requesting assistance. Um, you should have in your packet some information that we provided. What we're looking for is an appropriation request, both from the House and the Senate. We're planning on a $2,980,000 new public safety facility, phase one, which would be the fire department. Um, the city has uh, set aside $2 million for that project. We're making an appropriations request for $980,000. And uh, we've already submitted a request to uh, Representative Sabatini. Um, I haven't had a chance to talk to you yet, Senator uh, Baxter. Uh, we're in your district, but I know we're at the very, very far uh, south end. Um, yeah. But I'm working with Crick uh, Dawson, and we'll be able to provide you an appropriation form for request in the Senate. And just a little history, um, the station will not just serve the city of Mascot, but through our mutual aid agreement with Lake County, Grove, and Mineo, and Claremont Fire Departments, will actually serve all residents and businesses of South Lake as we all help each other out. As I said, uh, the city over the past eight years has gone from the brink of financial emergency, which in layman's terms is bankruptcy, in 2011, to being debt-free today. The city has also rolled back and cut taxes for the last six years of the eight years that I've served as city manager, and we felt it was important that the city demonstrate it is on sound financial footing and has reduced taxes for our businesses and residents before we thought it was appropriate to seek assistance from the state delegation. So hopefully you would look upon this uh, one-time request for funding a public safety building that will not only outlast our time, but uh, benefit the South Lake uh, community for a long time, and hopefully both the House and gives our Senator the response to that um, appropriations. Appreciate that. Well, thank you, and I appreciate your thoughtful explanation of how this really is part of a regional plan, and, uh, and I also appreciate that you're significantly sharing expense on. That, that is a tremendous help to us when we're trying to make our case that the local community, even a small community, is making a sacrificial effort to, to make to make that happen. 
So thank you, and uh, absolutely. And Debbie Dennis right there at your elbow, she knows all about this, and she's on top of it. She knows this is a priority to me. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, we'll next recognize City of Mineola, Pat Kelly, Mayor. If you can address us, please. Good evening. Good afternoon. Sorry. I'm kind of new to this. The first time I showed up, y'all probably didn't know me a little bit. Just a, just a brief thing. I've been the mayor for 12 years. Um, we're actually here not asking for anything. I think it would be pretty selfish for us to pretty much been self sufficient. For I took over 10 years ago. Again, we're about on the brink of bankruptcy. In the last, since I've been there, we've had over $65 million worth of infrastructure projects done. Um, we've had no tax increases. We've not drawn from our budget. We've not taken out any loans. Um, and we were, and I've got seen the LGCs that actually went below the rollback rate this year with our taxes, and we continue to, continue to do that from that aspect. Um, the biggest problem we have in South Lake County is infrastructure roads. We've all identified that. Uh, so, Mineola, what we did is last year we implemented a fire moratorium on annexation and approval of any more houses until this gets under control. We pretty much made developers pay for roads, and we've got plans in process to fill up all our roads. The only road that we don't have control over is how we keep it road. It needs to get fixed. Um, my council has passed a resolution saying that should be the number one priority for the state is to fix roadlands roads. Us and many all will take care of ourselves and we can roll back taxes and we appreciate your support. That's pretty much it in a nutshell. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And make make sure Debbie Dennis has all the information on the project because that's obviously under good management. We want Thank you, sir. Uh, I'd like to next recognize uh, Troy Singer, the mayor of the city of Tiberias. And he is going to speak from the high end of the room. Um, and uh, Matt will be bringing you a microphone if you don't have it. Yes, Senator, I have one. Thank you very much. And, uh, yeah, I figured it'd be easier to talk from up here than me trying to come down there. But uh, I just want to say thank you to the senator and the representatives for being here. And, listen to everybody. Uh, the City of Tiberias respectfully request support for the following five items. One, the Tiberias Council and its citizens are asking you to consider uh, legislation that permits golf carts crossing state roads at signal signalized intersections where a city has an approved golf cart ordinance. Currently, the state permits our golf carts to cross State Road 19 at Den River Road intersection, but it does not permit the crossing at State Road 441 at the Wimbledon Shopping Center intersection. We are hoping that you can fix the legislation that prevents the crossing at one State Road intersection, but not another. Number two, we have a seaplane base airport that is approved for grants to make it safe, and we encourage you to support the State Aviation Grant Program this year. And three, Tiberius continues to put forth stormwater projects to clean up our lakes, and we encourage you to support those projects. Four, we are expanding our senior service program and are hopeful that you will support us in that initiative. And finally, we are building a history museum and are hopeful that you will support this initiative. And I just once again want to thank you all for your time and your service and your dedication. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Um, that's, uh, I think, all of our municipal representation here. We'll move to Higher Ed, University of Central Florida, Janet Owen, Vice President for Government Relations. <coughs> you are recognized. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Good afternoon. Greetings from the trustees, faculty, students, and staff of the University of Central Florida. Really pleased to be on this beautiful campus of Lake Sumter State College as it is a direct connect partner. Uh, and it's just it's wonderful. Um, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about UCF's vital role in fueling talent and ideas for Central Florida and across our state. Um, we've been measuring our success by a formula uh, that is scale times excellence equals impact. And by all accounts, UCF has achieved scale and is doubling down on excellence and building on established areas of distinctive strengths, uh, really focusing, and, and it's time for that. Um, 
And we couldn't be prouder of our faculty and students, and I want to just tell you briefly that we have a record freshman class uh, with average high school GPAs of a 4.15 and an SAT score of 1330. We have 90 new National Merit or Beneficio scholars. Uh, puts our total at 324, which is well above everybody else in the state. We're really proud of that. Record research, um, we're putting 16,000 graduates out a year. And I just want to leave you with two things. Um, one, we're the four years in a row, the number one supplier of uh, graduates to the defense kind of employees, if you will, the defense and aerospace industries. And 30% of the employees at Kennedy Space Center have a UCF degree. Um, but we are now um, focusing on a national search for a new leader. Uh, it's officially underway. The search firm has, or the search committee has not been appointed yet. But I want to let you know that, that the interim president, Bad Seymour, is not caretaking, but really moving the university forward and improving in all areas. He's focusing on strengthening our operations, obviously rebuilding trust, um, expanding our resources and investing in excellence. And this is a multi-pronged approach, which includes finding efficiencies, doing cost-cutting within the university uh, to find resources, as well as doubling down on our e efforts to find non-state uh, resources for the university. So that goes along to support what you all are doing to support uh, UCF, for which we're grateful. But this year, we're asking you to help us with a uh, part of this initiative that we're calling UCF Forward. It's an $18.4 million uh, recurring request that really focuses on new faculty in STEM and healthcare programs, driving student success and the research enterprise uh, to both uh, provide economic diversity and prosperity, more advisors to help our students stay on track, graduate within four years, lower costs, and best prepare them for high paying jobs, and then support for our research and industry partnerships to define uh, which define our distinctive e excellence. And these are in the areas of our strengths as, as engineering, computing, modeling and simulation, augmented reality, virtual reality, um, optics and photonics in those areas. We're also seeking $3.7 million in non-recurring funding to support UCF Restores, the PTSD clinic. Um, and that's improving the lives of veterans, first responders, and law enforcement personnel. It's treating more than 750 service members um, with a 76% uh, success rate of not having to come back for more treatment. And so at the end of the day, we could not do this without you. And on behalf of, of our whole UCF community, we thank you uh, for your leadership and your support. And like we like to say, go Knights. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I would like to tell you that uh, I worked with David Mueller, Dr. David Mueller, on uh, when there was a broad effort to build this relationship with the state colleges that were around the, the region, and um, I really appreciate that and uh, opening of doors for people who complete a four-year degree at, at all the two-year schools, uh, which are now some offering some four-year programs of their own. But the relationship with the university to do that is particularly beneficial to our constituents that are working their way, they're colleging their way through work, and. Um, so, um, I, I love to see those ladders close together where you can keep learning and keep growing, you know. I just have a son after 15 years of law enforcement with some degrees in that arena. Um, told me and said, I think I should go to law school. And, and I hope we would all be teaching people to be lifelong learners and not be afraid to make new steps that are beneficial as they go. And, um, even this marriage would, uh, you know, more uh, technical school type things. I, I hope we keep pathways open. I, I don't want to just have things work out that you choose a path or you get assigned a path. And uh, but that can, that continuity goes on so that you can still move back and forth. You may start out getting some industry credentials in construction so that you're immediately valuable financially to your family and to the community, but also that you see things you want to do. You keep going and get a degree in construction management or something. So uh, thank you for working on that pathway for a long time, and uh, I hope it will remain a priority for you. I'd also like to thank you that I've had two legislative interns that were absolutely the best. The way you're running your program, 
uh, is very meaningful and it's actually a great asset to the Senate, <coughs> Senate office that we had that relationship with you and I thank you. She has a question for you here. I would echo that the internship program is phenomenal. Sarah Lynn came out of the internship program and now she's my legislative aide. So, um, two questions. One, did the 18.4 million request, did you say that was recurring? Yes. It's a recurring request. Okay. And then my other question in that, I see you have an ask for 90 faculty members. That's part of the $12.9 million ask. So that would be roughly about a salary of $143,000 each. What are those 90 faculty members for? Are they classroom teachers? Are they across um, the board? They are primarily um, teaching, but there are also some research in there as well. And I can give you a breakdown. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll next hear from Lake Sumter State College, Dr. Heather Figueres. Our host. Back again. Good. <clears throat> Lake Sumter State College was founded 57 years ago with 250 students taking classes in portable units. The college has grown to serve over 6,000 students annually between three campuses. This fall, the college experienced record-breaking enrollment of over 5,200 students in associate, baccalaureate, and workforce certificate programs. We are proud to serve the higher education needs of Lake and Sumter counties and truly appreciate the support that you have provided to Lake Sumter over 57 years. This year, the college has identified three priorities for which we are asking your support. First, we're requesting support of our math emporium. Nationally, students are struggling to master the foundational skills necessary for them to advance in their academic endeavors. Lake Sumter State College redesigned their curriculum in 2014 to provide more support to students using an Emporium model, secured Title III funding, and continue to see improved success. Unfortunately, that funding expires this year, and we will need additional support to continue that model. Second, we are requesting funding for critical facility repairs in Southland to support our stable, or to, excuse me, to support the stability of our air conditioning and humidity controls. We need that same investment on the Leesburg campus, and we've provided you with a full listing of all of our critical repair needs so that you have a comprehensive understanding of why we're requesting those funds for Southlake. We continue to work toward the improvement of all of our facilities to provide clean, attractive, and comfortable learning environments and work environments for our students, faculty, and staff. Finally, we're submitting a joint request with Lake Technical College to develop an emerging media arts program. This will prepare the workforce to fulfill the demand for jobs in our local and regional markets. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you again today and your continued support for Lake Center. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're well aware of your building situation and it's been a plague to me that we have not been able to address that effectively. These buildings are of an age that if we don't take care of them, we continue to lose them. And uh, this main campus needs that attention. It's very high on my radar. Thank you. We'll move to the uh, public hear hearing portion uh, of individuals. Uh, Mary Martinez, if you would come now, from the Howard Phillips Center for Children and Families. And Carmen Cullen will follow her Educational Foundation of Lake County. So you can be on deck. Thank you very much for coming, Ms. Martinez, and you're recognized. Is she not here? Okay, well, very good. Ms. Cullen, would you please come to the Educational Foundation of Lake County and share with us? Thank you. Good <coughs> evening, uh, Senator Representatives. My name is Carmen Cullen, and I serve as the Executive Director of the Educational Foundation for Lake County. We are the direct support organization for Lake County Public Schools. Last year, we raised and invested $1,022,000 into our schools and impacted 22,493 students as well as 1,043 teachers and 487 support staff. One of the keys to our success is being able to leverage state dollars 
to encourage our private sector to invest in our classrooms through the School District Education Foundation Matching Grant Program. Senator Baxley and Representative Sabatini, you saw firsthand what that leverage can do. In a room that had 450 people, we raised $25,000 in two nights towards this initiative. And thank you for being the 2019 Stephen Hill star. Of the five million allocated for the past school year, our Education Foundation locally received $75,763, which we doubled to fund career and technical education with a focus on our construction academies, our teacher and aviation, and culinary academies. Statewide, through the Consortium of Florida Education Foundation, funding is going to locally driven initiatives in 62 school districts and impacted 121 projects, all with measurable outcomes, each specifically designated to address priority areas in those communities. We know you will have to make tough decisions about allocating limited dollars, and we ask that you make this proven statewide program a priority in the pre-K-12 education budget for 2020-2021. 4 million of our funding last year was reoccurring. 1 million was non-reoccurring. We would like to thank you, first of all, for your support and ask that you continue to support the students and teachers in the counties that you represent. In your packet, you have a um, sheet which highlights collectively the work across the state as well as an individualized district impact sheet indicating what work was done in your district. Thank you. Thank you for your time and your attention. Thank you. If you could stay at the podium in a moment. Representative Sullivan would like to ask a question. I just want to compliment you on your efforts. I just finished touring the last public school in um, my district. I went to all the traditional land charters. And in schools all across my district, they um, pointed out different ways that the Education Foundation Lake County has enhanced their campus or added a program or a project, and that, that was great to see. And so we see that everywhere, the fruit of your labor. And I'm especially excited for the partnership you guys have at Humatilla High School with the new Aviation Club and that program that's getting started. So I just want to speak um, to reiterate everything that she said and really the great work that you're doing here in our schools. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else? All right, then I'm going to call on uh, Paul Owens of Thousand Friends of Florida. Thank you for coming, sir. We recognize Thank you, Chairman Baxley and the members of the delegation. I appreciate the opportunity to address you, and I thank each of you for your service to this community and our state. One Thousand Friends of Florida is a nonprofit dedicated to protecting our environment, our economy, and our quality of life in Lake County and throughout our state from the threat of runway growth and incompatible development. We do have a long history of teaming up with citizens in Florida to promote responsible growth and environmental protection. Earlier this year, I attended a Lake County Commission workshop to express our support for measures to protect the green swamp. We do care about the environment and the future here in Lake County. I'm going to limit my remarks to three of our top priorities for the upcoming session. First and foremost, we're calling on legislators to reverse a historic mistake made in the 2019 session. An amendment to House Bill 7103 that threatens ordinary Floridians with financial ruin for exercising their right to file legal challenges to development orders that are inconsistent with comprehensive plans. As you know, comprehensive plans are local government blueprints for orderly, environmentally responsible, and taxpayer-friendly development. Consistency challenges from citizens are the only mechanism to enforce comprehensive plans. The amendment to 7103 forces citizens who file consistency challenges and lose to pay the legal costs of the winning side. Few, if any, citizens can afford to take that risk. Uh, this disastrous amendment was never subjected to public testimony, never analyzed by staff, and never debated by legislators. It cuts the heart out of what's left of growth management in Florida, and the timing couldn't be worse 
with Florida adding more than 900 residents a day. This is the time for legislators to build up growth management, not tear it down. There are two bills, Senate Bill 250 and House Bill 6019, which would repeal this amendment. And they've been filed for the 2020 session. These bills deserve enthusiastic bipartisan support. Secondly, we ask legislators to pass comprehensive legislation to crack down on water pollution from all sources. And this legislation could include the funding that Commissioner Campione requested for state matching grants to convert septic to sewer. Finally, we ask you to protect environmentally sensitive land with the funding that the public has been waiting for since voters overwhelmingly passed the Land and Water Conservation Amendment in 2014. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Uh, next, we will hear from Misha Bookbinder, Early Learning Coalition of Lake County, and Andy Pua will follow him for us as he's on. Good afternoon, I'm Chairman and Delegation Members. Thank you for having um, uh, this opportunity for me to speak to you and the group. It's always great to kind of get everybody together. Um, I wish it was a bigger turnout. Um, you guys do some fantastic work in Tallahassee and here locally, and I wish that the community um, would take advantage of the opportunity to come and see you. But I am, so I'm going to get into my three minutes. Um, I feel like I made notes uh, for everybody speaking, and I feel like early learning plays a role in everything. So, Senator, you talked about lifelong learning that starts at early learning. We talked about Groveland getting 400 jobs. Guess what? They're going to have kids, and they're going to need to go to child care. That's early learning. They don't wake up. They're not born ready to go to college. That's early learning. They're not born ready to go to kindergarten either. That's early learning. And so everything that we do at the Early Learning Coalition, one of 30 across the state, is about preparing our children. Um, having that desire to learn, but also keeping them safe. But I want to just thank the representative Sullivan for all the hard work she's done over her three terms in, in education, um, because it's important to continue to be accountable for the state and federal dollars that we have uh, to make sure that kids remain safe. I wanted to just say a little bit about the, um, we had a, a 1091, House Bill 1091, that was actually um, effective as of July 1 of 18 um, this past year, and it allowed us to um, focus on that teacher-child interactions. Um, in Lake County, we have 77% um, of our children that are uh, enrolled in attending facilities who are scoring um, that program assessment score of 4.0 or more. And so it's fantastic that the majority of our providers are where they need to be in those scores, and the majority of our children are where they need to be in, in, in these um, programs. We have over 4,200 children right now currently receiving services in Lake County for school readiness and volunteer pre kindergarten. Um, and so continuing to support um, all bills related to that early learning component is key. I don't have a specific ask for you today. We do foresee some early learning bills coming to the floor. And so when those bills come to the floor, I will be coming to you individually asking for the support of those bills. But really want to maintain accountability, increase funding for voluntary pre kindergarten, um, align voluntary pre kindergarten with school readiness when it comes to accountability measures, making sure that we're treating those programs the same and just continue to support the, the dollars for these programs. When and those dollars are available to be supported. So that's why I have you today, Senator. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I have been observing there's some exchanging of information that there may be some rewrite and rejuvenation. May that be a great time of opportunity uh, this year as, as uh, I hear some dialogue out there from other members and, um, that we may be doing something significant with uh, the early learning sector. So, uh, you, you stay involved and make sure it's something good. Absolutely. I don't know why I prepared these cards, because I didn't really want one of them. <laughs> but I was prepared. So I'm also available if you have any questions or you want to reach out, or a tour. So anybody wants an early learning tour, I'm the person to put up for you. So take care. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. I love reading the little kids. It's, uh, and everybody has seen the ball guy, you know, and they like these little kids <laughs> like you my head. And it's kind of interesting. But uh, it is, uh, granddad's the best job ever, and many, many, many of these kids don't really have intact relationships that are supportive and are setting the stage for them. So thank you for being there and doing that. Okay, we will turn to Andy Dubois of Florida Citizens Alliance. That's one of your many hats, right? Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, delegation. As you said, I'm on here on behalf of 
Florida Citizens Alliance, which is a nonprofit grassroots alliance of individuals and groups committed to real solutions that improve student learning in Florida's public schools. Today, our 50,000 supporters ask you for your continued legislative support in promoting universal parental choice, support knowledge-based learning, adopt the finest standards and curricula, <coughs> encourage financial transparency and best practices, and stop political, religious, and pornographic indoctrination of our children. Let me point out some key highlights in our 2020 legislative agenda. One, support Governor DeSantis' executive order to write world-class standards and adopt world-class curriculum. These distinctively Florida standards and curriculum will focus on teaching the academic basics of reading, writing, math, and civics while eliminating social emotional learning. Two, expand parental choice options and eligibility for the Gardner, Hope, Tax Credit, and Family Empowerment Scholarships. Make public schools safe for every child, of course. Number four, improve legal definition of instructional materials used in public schools as textbooks, online, supplemental, and library materials. Five, strengthen Florida statutes to protect minors in our schools from exposure to pornographic material. Our children must be legally protected from harmful materials. Six, incentivize failing school districts to adopt proven alternative models such as IDEA schools and Hillsdale College Barney Charter School Initiative Program. Seven, adopt the alternate, alternate authorizers of K through 12 public education, public schools, sorry. Number eight, align teacher certification with Florida's new world-class standards and curriculum. And with that, I'd like to thank you so much for your consideration and your legislative support in this effort. And thank you so much for your service to our state and our community. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Given us a lot to pursue there. That's excellent. I appreciate your participation. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right. Stuart Clapp of the Lake County Education Assistant. Is it Clayton or Clapp? Clapp. Clapp. That's what I thought. Right. <coughs> Excuse me, but uh, you are recognized. And All right. I appreciate you going here with us. Good afternoon, delegation. Uh, I'm just a public school teacher in Florida, a state that is the third largest economy in the nation, 17th largest economy in the world. Depending on the study, pays public school teachers 46, 48th in the nation. Lake County pays her teachers 50 out of 61. You heard. The superintendent talked about our funding being 61 out of 67. So basically, Lake County public school teachers are some of the lowest paid in the nation. Now, I do want to compliment the governor on his announcement for teacher salaries. I'm glad that the attention is becoming to teacher salaries. I think it's very important. Um, but then, there's some questions, the devil in the detail, if you will. Um, with experienced teachers, is this going to be a converse uh, uh, increase as well, or a variation of, of one of the bonus programs that we've seen for the last several years? Um, are we going to be including non-classroom, non-load-bearing teachers? Are media center, our guidance counselors, our individual uh, coaches that work with students on their academic skills. Because we've excluded them from a lot of our programs historically. Are we going to be including our educational staff professionals, 
our age, our other people within the school that have are basically paid at one of the lowest rates in the nation as well. Now, I do have to compliment you all on increasing the FEFP last year. That was needed. Increasing the base student allocation was definitely needed. Money that can be used for teacher salaries um, in a lot of counties. So, we know that the voters in 20 counties in Florida have made sure they've passed additional millage to benefit their public schools. We know that we, our parents in our communities, want world-class public schools. Our students deserve world-class public schools. We know also that education is a bipartisan issue. It's not a long party line issue. It ignores party line issues. So, we also know for two decades, the legislature has spent a lot of time on testing, bonus schemes, um, that we need to get back to actual testing, or actual student achievement and, and support of our teachers in Lake County. So overall, we need an investment in public schools, and our students, parents, and communities deserve that because that's going to make a better workforce as we move into the next decade. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you coming. Rick Henke with the uh, Livestream Behavioral Center. And you are recognized. After that will be Gail Formanak of the League of Women Voters. Good afternoon. My name is Rick Hankey. I'm the Executive Vice President for Lifestream Behavioral Center. Lifestream is a comprehensive behavioral health organization that serves Lake, Sumter, and Citrus counties. And let me start off by saying thank you. Thank you for your past, current, and future support of behavioral health services that has allowed us to serve over 24,000 individuals on an annual basis. Our society is profoundly affected by mental illness and substance addiction. Now more than ever, the need to face mental health and substance abuse is critical to Lake County county's future. Prevention, treatment, and support to help people recover from mental illness and drug and alcohol addiction is essential strategies for the health and prosperity of individuals, families, community, communities, and our county. Livestream Behavioral Center requests your, our, that our previous legislative appropriation of $1,123,634, which has been funded in past legislative sessions on a non-recurring basis, be restored to the original amount and made a recurring allocation for the fiscal year 2021 legislative session. Unfortunately, while this allocation was fully funded during the last five legislative se sessions, it was reduced to $250,000 this last year. This drastically reduced the number of funded indigent paper act beds. Ultimately, this reduction uh, will result in increased costs to the community due to the lack of services. The appropriation of fully funded funds nine indigent paper act beds for Lake County. The appropriation has allowed Lifestream to move forward with constructing a new crisis stabilization unit in Claremont in South Lake County to service that fast growing portion of the county. Lifestream will provide the building with no um, state outlay request. The number of individuals served in the Lifestream Psychiatric Hospital Crisis Stabilization Units and the severity of their issues has expanded significantly over the past years. <coughs> um, over the past six years, the demand for involuntary examinations required by the state or the Baker Act has grown 44% for adults and 55% for children. As the number of, of served has increased each year, the need for additional crisis stabilization beds for indigents in Lake County <coughs> is apparent. Lifestream is constructing, as I mentioned earlier, a 10-bed crisis stabilization unit that will be in Claremont. The increased capacity will help to ensure these services are available when needed by law enforcement, the judicial system, and the overall community. Lifestream and the community it serves appreciate your consideration for the full restoration of the $1,123,634 allocation. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Next, we'll hear from Gail Almanac and Women Rivers. You recognize me. Thank you very much for hearing me today. Um, the League is of the villages and the Tri County area, which includes Lake. Sumter and Marion counties. 
Uh, we're just going to speak about our education priorities today, although in your packet you should have our full legislative priorities and our one-page summary of our VPK study. I want to first talk about our VPK study. I think all of you have been very gracious to hear from us personally about the results, with the exception of uh, Representative Sabatini, who was called away from our meeting due to his service with the National Guard. But otherwise, you've all heard our spiel about our study and the results in which we found uh, a lot of good things going on in our VPK classrooms in the Tri-County area. But our chief concern is about teacher quality, uh, especially regarding instruction. So we really believe that uh, the VPK program needs a shot in the arm, better reimbursement for the providers, as well as specific funding for teacher training in the area of instruction. And since the governor has prioritized this and we hear that something is coming forth as far as some major adjustments, we hope you'll support those. Just a couple of other things regarding K-12 education. We hope you'll consider supporting uh, Governor DeSantis' proposal to provide a base salary, a larger base salary. Our concern is, again, that there are just too many uh, teachers, well, too many kids sitting in classrooms this fall with substitute teachers because of the teacher shortage. And so we really need to get those staff rooms um, staffed with adequately prepared people, and this would certainly be an answer to that. And then our other thing uh, that we just want to bring forth would be accountability for all schools that accept public dollars. That would be public schools, charter schools, as well as private schools that accept any kind of public money for scholarships. Um, these, all of these schools need to have common testing measures because if you're all concerned about choice for parents, parents need common metrics to be able to make the appropriate choices for their students. So that means common testing. So they need to know how they all stand up one against another. So I really hope you'll consider uh, that when you think about accountability for K-12 schools. And again, thank you for your time and your service today. Thank you very much for coming, and, and to come see us personally, too. I appreciate it. Amy Wise, Special Olympics 2022 USA Games. You are recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Senator uh, Baxley and delegation members. In June 2022, more than 4,000 elite athletes and 125,000 spectators will travel across the U.S. and the Caribbean to Florida to unite and participate in one of the world's most cherished sporting events, an event that only happens once every four years, the Special Olympics USA Games. This is big. Uh, in fact, it will be the largest humanitarian event ever in Florida. Uh, in winning its bid to host the nationally covered USA Games, Florida will be at the epicenter of the inclusion movement. We have the opportunity to <coughs> open the hearts and minds of the nation toward people with intellectual disabilities. Uh, here are the facts. Uh, there are 850,000 Special Olympic athletes across the USA. Those athletes, their family, and their friends, and the entire nation will watch as 4,000 of their teammates and 1,900 coaches and officials travel to Florida for the games. Uh, it is projected that 125,000 fans and spectators will attend the games for an economic impact well over 69 million. Your USA Games organizing committee is busy today uh, preparing the foundation for the games uh, by negotiating our venue contracts throughout Central Florida, uh, building our outreach initiatives, uh, and fundraising to cover the projected $20 million cost of hosting the games. Uh, of that $20 million budget, we are asking for only 5% from the state. That's $500,000 from the 2021 fiscal budget and $500,000 uh, the year after for a total of $1 million over the next two years. Uh, the remaining $19 million, or 95% of our budget, is being actively raised and secured through corporate partnership, personal giving initiatives, and through the support of local government. That means that for every state dollar, we will generate $19 of local and private money. Uh, your funding helps build a logistical foundation for the games and, uh, and begins our marketing outreach as well. It also secures transportation and accommodations to our athletes and coaches, as well as food for our athletes, officials, and coaches. And most important, it helps us in providing more than 10,000 individual athlete health exams 
in eight different focus areas, including optometry uh, 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 and dental, it, to help people with intellectual disabilities live healthier, longer lives. Uh, please join us in supporting the 2022 USA Games, uh, and together we can show the world uh, the ability and the humanity of our athletes. Uh, we have truly a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity uh, to put Florida center stage uh, as a leader in the inclusion movement. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Have you talked with any specific member of the legislature about filing the appropriations request? Oh, we have, yes. So uh, Representative Pompow is going to be sponsoring it okay. on the House side. And the Senate side, we're, uh, we're approaching some folks right now. Okay. Uh, Debbie Dennis is right there on the front row. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> I've got a special love in that area. You know, a lot of all these guys know I, I have two kids that were foster kids. My son's blind and brain damaged from shaking baby as an infant. And came to us at eight months and he's now 23. And we participated in a lot of these things. No, he's 32. I got I transposed that. I was dyslexic. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, it's so exciting to see them achieve, and it's very invigorating. You know that everybody counts in America and across the world, and that uh, they're being recognized for what they do. So, uh, thank you for your work. Thank you. Got a little heartbeat uh, pull there on that one. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you. Hard strings, I mean. I hope I got a heartbeat. <laughs> okay, Tommy uh, Steinruck from Mid Florida Homeless Coalition. Would you please share with us? Good afternoon. Uh, first, I'd like to apologize. My printer broke, so the uh, handouts I wanted to give are at home, and I had to handwrite my speech, so now I have to read my own writing. <laughs> May not be good. Um, so good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to be here. My name is Tommy Steinrock and I am the Operations Director with Mid-Florida Homeless Coalition. Mid-Florida Homeless Coalition is uh, the lead agency for Citrus, Hernando, Lake and Sumter counties and we're also known as the Continuum of Care. We are requesting uh, no cuts to the recurring staffing grant and the $618,500 in recurring challenge grant funds. These funds are in the DCF recurring budget. Staffing funds have been especially helpful to the smaller COCs such as ours. Without them, our COC would no longer be able to operate. Additionally, the coalition is requesting a continuation of the Homeless Challenge Grant funds. Our communities have used these funds to move households from homelessness to housing to self-sufficiency. Our written standards indicate that 80% of households that have exited these programs remain in permanent housing. The subrecipients are maintaining these requirements and often cases exceeding them at 100%. Um, affordable housing is an issue in our area. Housing that is affordable to those who are working as well as those on SSI and SSDI is greatly needed. We have assisted many families in obtaining housing only to find out a year later rents have dramatically increased and they can no longer afford the home. Uh, making it necessary to attempt to find alternative housing and oftentimes we are unable to do so. A lack in affordable housing is one cause of the homelessness in our area. Homeless, uh, the other issue we'd like to address is the homeless statute rewrite. This rewrite was presented last year but didn't quite make it to the finish line. DCF is proposing during the 2020 <coughs> legislative session revisions which conform state law to current federal law um, provide grant program definition and also clarify statutory responsibilities for local homeless continuums of care lead agencies while uh, preserving financial and programmatic accountability provisions in state law for programs administered by state office of homelessness. We support these changes. The difference between the two bills is how the challenge grant would be funded. We support the rewrite but would rather have challenge grant funding through DCF than lose it altogether. We recognize that there are those who do not support funding the challenge grant with the Sadowski funds. Mid Florida Homeless Coalition has em implemented best practices to prevent, divert, and end homelessness for one household at a time. We need your help to continue to the progress that, has be that is being made. 
Smaller lead, lead agencies like Mid Florida Homeless Coalition depends on you and these funds to continue services in our community. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate you coming. Uh, Vance Jokum, you are next. Fiscal Rangers. Vance Jokum. I mean, I'm never sure I pronounced your last name right whenever I look at it. You can fix this on that. After him will be Dr. Doreen Dupont, the Democratic Environmental Caucus of Florida. Hi, Vance Yoakum. It's pronounced like uh, Admiral Yoakum, if you remember that. Close to you? Many years ago, yes. Uh, I write the blog FiscalRangers.com. As you all know, I kind of focus on fiscal issues and taxpayer issues. So I have some handouts here. Who would I give them to? Because I couldn't make the. Our staff. And uh, I'm just going to go through the bullet points here. Um, the first one to, that is huge to me, that the need, I think the voters and everybody in this state need your help, is that the ADA lawsuits against cities have forced a dramatic drop in the transparency of information available to taxpayers. If you go on websites where you used to be able to see 100, 200, 300 page packet of information including all the planning and zoning documents <coughs> or proposed developments, now you get 35 pages. You have to know to ask the city council to email it to you because they don't even, they're even afraid to put that availability on the website. Their lawyers are telling them because of the ADA lawsuits over website uh, capability. To me that's a wrong interpretation, it needs to be fixed. Um, the, it's reduced because the, the scanning tools used by sight limited people can't use, uh, can't read handwriting. They can't put the uh, contribution records for voters in elections online anymore. Mount Dora was doing that. They had a great page for all that information. And now it's just completely blitzed because of the worry about being sued because the software is not good enough for 2% of the population uh, that uh, say they want everything to be accessible to them. And so because of that, in my opinion, 98% of the world population that reads English, written English, and can read websites is being denied information related towards local government activities. Okay, another one is that uh, the cities are performing an annexation blackmail of rural county areas because the health department is telling developers that well, if you want to uh, develop a uh, proposed uh, development, um, kind of like a housing track, then you have to connect to water and sewer in the city. And then the sewer says, you have to annex in. You, we aren't going to just extend the, the line to you. And so as a consequence, that bumps the costs up even more. And people that live in the rural areas, their entire idea of having a dream home in a rural area in this county, in Florida counties, is being ruined. There's just a, I've, I've been making videos of these meetings and they are just inflamed over it. And Tavares is one here locally that has inflamed them quite a bit with this and I made videos of that and I think that needs to, something needs to be changed so that they cannot force people to be annexed in. There are several other things on here. One of my favorites is constitutional officers get over 50 percent of the county property tax revenues and yet they do not have any requirements in their founding legislation to be able to provide a detailed budget online. They aren't required to have a performance audit, so like the sheriff here has never had one. And I'm a former, you know, internal auditor, did performance audits, and they've never had them to make sure they're efficient, effective, and economical. So there are other issues on here. I will send you more information on these. But I think that these are things that I would hope that you add. You work on a lot of important issues in each of your favorite areas, whether it's education or gun rights or other things like that, and straw rights. That, <laughs> and oh, by the way, <coughs> no common core. I thought I'd wear this. Uh, but uh, well, I thank you for your time. You've come a long way somehow. It's good. Yes, sir, you recognize. One follow-up comment. It's. Uh, 64% of the county's budget is uh, tied up in the constitutional officer budgets. 50% for just our uh, elected sheriff. Just wanted to make that for the record. 
All right. Uh, sounds like some homework there for you. So seeing what we can do about more accurate public information on those funds. Thank you for bringing those to our attention. Dr. Doreen DuPont, Democratic Environmental Caucus of Florida, you are recognized. Thank you. I feel so honored to be here. I'm from Sarasota County, but I love Lake County. I actually celebrated my birthday here in February. And I am a conservation voter. I care deeply about our environment. And I'm here to ask you to try to close a loophole in the way Florida enforces the Clean Air Act. Towards the end of July, I almost fell into traffic when a, a truck driving by spewed black smoke on me. It startled me and I stumbled. I went to the police department to find out if that was legal, and they told me that it was it, it, that it should be illegal, that the, the Clean Air Act prohibits that, but that Florida doesn't enforce it. So I did some research about it. I found out that it's called coal rolling, and that's when somebody puts a switch into their exhaust system, and when they flip the switch, the mix of air and fuel is altered so that Temporaneously, temporaneously, a vehicle can spew out black smoke. And some people think it's a joke, but I don't. I'd like you to correct that. Now, with the help of Congressman Vern Buchanan's office, doing a lot of research, I pinpointed the statute that would deal with this. as 316.2935, and therein lies the loophole. What that statute does in the effort to prohibit tampering of the air pollution control equipment, it makes selling your vehicle difficult. You can only sell it to a dealer if you've altered it. But the only measure, the only standard about what comes out of your tailpipe is that you shouldn't be able to see the emissions for more than five seconds at a time. And as it is now, if, if you're caught doing that and it's more than five seconds, then you get an, a non-moving violation, which police can use to say, hey, you need to get your, your vehicle checked. There's something wrong with your uh, emission system. Well, I thought about what's the most cost-effective way to make it illegal to do that, because the police told me that I should go to my legislators and keep on them until they change it because there's nothing they can do now to protect our air, to protect our roads from people doing that because of the way the statute was written. And I came up with the idea of a little insertion into that statute where if it's done intentionally, that it becomes a, a falls into careless driving which is a, a moving violation that's non-criminal. And doing that, it takes the burden off of the people who can't afford a newer car, and it doesn't stress the um, prison system. It gives the police something to work on. I, I want to ask you to please do that. Protect the natural charm of your county, which I love so dearly. Protect Florida, protect the air, set an example, and make this something illegal. I, I gave you the package, I gave you the statute, and I gave you the, def the statute that defines careless driving. I gave you a, a site of a, being done in some uh, place in, in Colorado where somebody took a picture of them doing it to some protesters, and the police were then able to enforce it. It sets a, a standard that Florida cares about the air, and we don't want um, endangering traffic and endangering people on the side of the road to do that, that Florida is invested in protecting their environment. I'm going around to all the different delegations. I'm really delighted to be here. Do you have any questions for me? No, thank you. I have seen some video of that happening. And I wonder Almost about, everybody I know has I, had I wondered about the status of whether you I'm probably the only person talking about it now, and I have actually honed in and pinpointed the exact problem. And I think I came up with the most efficient way to solve it. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. You got some. Okay, now we have some requests that 
and signed Kathy Ackerman, Executive Director, Fifth Circuit, Public Guardian Corporation. You were recognized. I must disclose, she's been an attorney of mine, but uh, she's moved on to much more important work. You recognize Kathy. Uh, thank you, Chairman Bexley and Foundation members. Uh, yes, I am the Executive Director of the Fifth Circuit Public Guardian Program. We cover five counties, of course, as I mean, and it includes Lake County here. Uh, we are funded by the DEOA on a contract. We're also funded by United Ways and uh, private contributions. We take care of folks who have been adjudicated by the court to be mentally incapacitated. <coughs> they have no friends and family who can help them, and they are indigent. Uh, we usually have them for life. I'm speaking today on behalf of the Florida Coalition of Public Guardian Programs, of which I'm an officer, and the coalition represents the membership of the 17 public guardian programs around the state. And and we have two legislative priorities that I wanted to bring to your attention today. The first one is to support the DEOA's legislative budget request to increase uh, support for public guardian programs around the state. The DEOA did a survey in the beginning of 2019, and in that survey they discovered that the actual true cost to per ward per year is $5,084, and that uh, they are now funded by the state at the rate of $3,054 per ward. And we want to thank you because the reason we have the $3,000 is because the legislature helped us last year with an increase, and we're asking for the rest of the increase to come up to the level that the study said uh, we needed. Uh, toward that end, right now we are taking care of statewide 3,846 wards and we have an annual return on investment to the state of roughly $30 million. In other words, the monies allocated versus the monies that the state pays us uh, reach a reward of about $30 million annually at this time. Um, the second uh, item of our priorities is a bill House, it's Senate Bill 344, which is being sponsored by Senator Bradley, and House Bill 211 uh, is uh, Representative Fernandez Barkeen. That has two parts to it. The first part would clear up an ambiguity in a statute that um, the 15 of the circuits right now don't have a problem with waiving the filing fees and other fees, clerk fees, for public guardian cases because they're indigents. And five of the circuits say that, well, Section 1 and Section 2 say the words public guardian, but Section 3 didn't, so we just want to clear that up. So we went to the uh, Florida court clerks and comptrollers and the state court administrators, and neither of those groups oppose us. And on the third one, which is um, ARNPs, we went to the uh, Florida Medical Association and they don't oppose that part of that same legislation, which would allow nurses to sign certain papers instead of having to have a doctor do it. And we appreciate your past support and thank you and hope you can support us again at this time. Thank you, Counselor. Could you just uh, take a moment and differentiate what you're doing from some of the popularized abuse of guardianships that we've been witnessing in much of the media. Yes, sir. Thank you for the opportunity to make a little statement on that. First of all, I, I, even though we're a, a public guardian, and that case was a public guardian, I mean a private guardian for profit, this is a case in Orlando, I think you're referring to, where a lady abused um, the privilege she had to help people as a professional guardian. Uh, public guardians are not funded by their wards. They're funded through the state because our wards are indigent. Um, we uh, are subject to a lot more regulation um, and a lot more auditing than private guardians are. I think Senator Pasadoma was actually this year starting to work on some legislation that may address 
those concerns, and we all applaud that very much. Um, I think that uh, the uh, Bar Association and um, other, other entities, including our coalition, will be working with the Senator, um, talking to her about that legislation. The main point I'd make is that um, public guardians serve a need over the last resort. If there's absolutely no one else, it's us. And we are as this, the work here describes what we do on a day-to-day -day basis to take care of all these folks and the materials I gave you. But the bottom line is we're the backstop. Um, if it's not for us, a lot of people will be in a lot of trouble and it will cost the taxpayers, sadly, a lot more money, too. Thank you for that explanation. Thank you. All right. We will next hear from Christopher Nunes, Florida College System, SGA. Yeah, I couldn't quite read your signature, so. I think, you, I think you had to leave. Okay, I believe you had to for Paula Shad, uh, dental therapy is her topic. Central Florida Dental Hygienist Association and Florida Dental Hygienist Association. Thank you, and you're recognized. Thank you. Chairman Baxley and representatives, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. <clears throat> My name is Paula Shedd. I'm a registered dental hygienist living in Lake County. I'm a member of the Central Florida Dental Hygienist Association, which includes Lake County, Marion, Sumter, and other local area counties, <clears throat> and a member of the Florida Dental Hygienist Association. The association asks for your support for dental therapy as a way of expanding access to affordable dental care for all Floridians. The 2020 legislation will create a new team, a, a new dental team member, the dental therapist. A dental therapist is a licensed advanced practice clinician who has completed an accredited dental therapy program of up to three years, depending on the prerequisites acquired before entering the program. Or it could be a 16-month program if uh, the candidate is a currently licensed dental hygienist. To be a licensed dental therapist, the individual must take and pass the same Florida board as a dentist for the tasks that are delicate to them. A dental therapist will practice under a collaborative management agreement as determined by a supervising dentist. The Florida Dental Hygienist Association is one of over 50 agencies and organizations who are members of the Floridians for Dental Access Coalition. This coalition is working to secure strong, bipartisan support from legislators, legislators and <coughs> coalition members for the 2020 legislation. Senate Bill 152 is sponsored by Senator Jeff Brandes, and the House Bill, which has not received a number yet, is sponsored by Representative Renee Placencia and Daniel Perez. I encourage you to support the Dental Therapy Bill. The handouts I provided you in the yellow folders <clears throat> contain a list of coalition members and further information about the dental therapy education, licensure, and supervision. I will be available, or um, another of our local dental hygiene, uh, the hygienist association members will be also available to meet with you um, if you would like. I thank you for your time and your service. Thank you very much. I appreciate you coming and clarifying that legislation and seeking our support. Okay, uh, or there, is there anyone else that wishes to speak? Okay, seeing no other public testimony cards and hearing that no, from no one that they would wish to speak at this time, we'll move to a couple of matters of business to close out our meeting while we're together. Um, one is we have a vacancy uh, on the uh, Harris Chain of Lakes Restoration Council, and it is the duty of this uh, delegation to appoint uh, those individuals. We are in receipt, according to uh, Chair Stargell, of one application that has been examined, uh, Dr. Dwayne Smith. And uh, I would uh, open the floor for a motion to make that appointment. Would anybody like to make that motion? I would that it be appointed and then before we have debate or comment after that. Mm -hmm. okay. So I'm Okay, we have a motion to appoint. Um, any questions? 
Okay, then we'll move to debate. Any debate? Just in general, yeah, he did a great city councilman. He'll do a good job on the board. And then I want to say a few things about the board in general. So, uh, you know, I filed a bill recently to uh, get rid of this board. Um, in 2008, there was a special select committee on sunsetting boards that were duplicative or unnecessary. And it actually recommended that we get rid of this board over a decade ago. Um, and the reason being, between St. John's and DEP and all these other entities that monitor water and environmental things, in addition to the Lake County Water Authority, which we have, the board really doesn't have a defined purpose, and so it's kind of lost its way. It was created in 2002, if I'm not mistaken, as a way of providing more oversight or scrutiny over the existing government entities that provide direction on how we restore our water, and it's, I think, in my opinion, failed to do so. Um, I think the Lake County Water Authority or some other entity might be a more appropriate vehicle, or perhaps the county we could amend uh, what they're doing or help them in some way. But the board itself, I don't think, really has, does that or really has effectively, I think, even the ability to do that. Um, it's not worked well at, at uh, achieving any uh, I think realistic goal in terms of a certain level of water quality. So I look forward to talking with the delegation more in the next few years, uh, months rather, <laughs> before session, about what we should do with the board. Like I said, I followed the bill to get rid of it, and uh, I'm okay with putting somebody on the board in the meantime to fulfill its duties until we make a determination on it. So, but I just wanted to say that because obviously we're putting somebody on the board that I don't think should exist, but it's important that we have the conversation <laughs> about it. So. Thank you. Any other input? Well, as the Senate sponsor, uh, I too, uh, there's, there's a certain level of frustration, a uh, number of resignations from this board. It's, uh, sometimes it can be a structural dysfunction in the fact that this kind of council was um, not empowered with anything other than an advisory role with the Water Management District. And um, there are a lot of cooks in the soup when it comes to water because it's such a very serious issue and um, sometimes uh, we get more government than we need and particularly with the number of resignations I've seen I think it's evidence that perhaps this has kind of reached its limit of trying to be an effective advisory council um, in the sense that it had no power to take the motions and resources with which to act to fulfill the kinds of decisions that they reached. So sometimes you do need to alter those, but meanwhile, that is not law. It has not passed. It will be considered in the 2020 session and due diligence and, and with the uh, pleasure of knowing that Dr. Smith would be willing to serve, we should uh, fill that vacancy until we see if we have a different structure moving forward. So, if there's no other debate, um, would you take the roll on it? Uh, Representative Haig? Yes. Representative Sabatini? Yes. Representative Sullivan? Yes. And Chair Baxley? Yes. So, by your vote, the appointment is done by this body. And thank you, Chad. Uh, we have one other housekeeping, and that is the election. We never did. For some reason, we didn't wind up with a vice chair last time we did elections. So we, we or maybe we had a resignation or something. I don't know what we did. But in any event, I understand we don't have one. And the suggestion uh, or the direction that the uh, chairman was moving was that we would just elect a new chair, vice chair, for the next year. Uh, the protocol, ladies and gentlemen, is that we alternate that between House and Senate. Uh, presently, the Senate <coughs> chair, uh, Senate Stargell, Senator Stargell has been uh, acting to direct uh, our affairs for us, and we appreciate her leadership. Uh, but I would open the floor for nomination of a new chair, which this time would be a House member, so we alternate that responsibility between House and Senate members. And uh, the board's open for nomination of a chairman for the next year. I'd like to nominate Representative Fred Haig. All right. He is uh, nominated. Are there any other nominations? 
Anybody wish to speak to the nomination? Um, okay. Uh, having no other nominees, uh, we will now take a vote on the. You were elected. Yes. Okay, thank you. I'd like to check those things. All right, uh, Chad. Please call the roll on the election of chairman. Representative Hay. Yes. Representative Sabatini. Yes. Representative Sullivan. Yes. Chair Baxter. Yes. Okay, and then we'll go ahead and fill the vice chair. Usually, the vice chair is of the opposing, the opposite chamber, the other chamber, so that uh, we continue alternating. Usually, that vice chair would become the next chair, uh, just you know, unless something else address protocol uh, variation there. So the floor is open for nomination of a vice chair for <laughs> delegation for the next year. I'd like to nominate the very honorable Senator Baxley, <laughs> based on his conduct during this meeting. <laughs> well, unfortunately, we're on limited options. <laughs> it's, it's Senator Stargell or Senator Baxley, so uh, yes, I will accept if elected. Any other nominations? Being none. Um, we'll vote on that. Chad, would you please call a uh, vote uh, in favor of the nominate or the appointment of uh, Dennis Baxley as vice chair of the delegation for the next year? Representative Hay. Yes. Representative Sabatini. Yes. Representative Sullivan. Yes. Chair Baxley. Yes. So by your vote, I accept that responsibility. Uh, seem no other business to be coming before the delegation and having heard well from the wonderful citizens of Lake County that we represent. And thank you all for allowing us just to be there and represent you in this discussion in Tallahassee. Uh, before we adjourn, I'm going to introduce uh, Representative Sullivan. She wants to introduce her staff. My apologies, I forgot to do it in my opening, but I did want to recognize Aileen Guy, who is my district aide. She handles all things in the district, and Sarah Lynn Ard, who is my legislative aide. So if you have any needs within the district, that would be Aileen, and any legislative requests or follow-ups from this meeting, if you could reach out to Sarah Lynn, that would be great. Really appreciate them. Thank you. Now, let's give all of our staff members a hand. Yes, sir. I believe, with your permission, one of our constitutional officers might want to make just a couple of remarks. I thought you were signaling that you wanted to make. A few okay, remarks. we still have time. Uh, we're happy to have Carrie Baker, our uh, famous but, Carrie Baker, yeah, yeah. and uh, we appreciate you coming as sure. a constitutional officer for the county, and you're recognized before we adjourn. The time starts now. <laughs> Thank you very much, Officer Sherman. Uh, just a couple things. Um, the Port Association of Proper Appraisers will be coming before you with several provisions. A couple of them I want to mention is that currently there's uh, several exemptions. One is a $500 exemption for widows and widowers and disabled. And $500 in taxable value exempted, which is worth about $10. And we'd like to see that increased so that folks can get more than a $10 exemption. It's hardly worth the paperwork. And so anywhere up to 5000 is authorized by law, so that would take it to a $100 exemption for a widow, widowers, or disabled. So that's one thought. And the other thing is affordability. That's where you take your Save Our Home savings with you to your new home. Uh, it's a, we call it a two-year, but it's really like two years as of January 1st. So it could be, it could be you could sell your home in 17, and really only have like a year and a month it, the way it's worded right now. So if we could make that instead of a two year, which might only be a one year, and make it a three year, which might actually be a two year. Um, so both in both those cases, those are very taxpayer friendly provisions that we're supporting and promoting. And I just wanted to mention those to you. And then also I'd like to talk just briefly about uh, transparency, budget transparency that uh, Representative Anthony Sabatini filed. Um, uh, because of the prompting of the good representative, I expanded what I show on my website. We had a one-page summary previously, and so now we've added an additional five pages of additional budget information, um, which was the right thing to do. And the only thing I would suggest is that uh, 
you don't sort of make us reinvent the wheel. We're, we're already reporting this to DOR or wherever. If we can somehow utilize what we already have, uh, I would appreciate that moving forward. And then taking off my property appraiser hat, I'm putting on my civilian hat. Um, I'd like to talk about uh, not expanding the red flag law. I think the one we have, um, it's tailored to making sure that law enforcement, if a red flag is used, that the law enforcement is involved in making that decision from the very get-go. The, the, what I'm hearing is it would allow a neighbor to make an accusation, you know, and, and folks that might have a, you know, a, a, might have other motives. So I think having law enforcement as the initial instigator of that is probably the better way. And then secondly, uh, universal background checks um, are not universal. Uh, obviously, criminals won't abide by them. Several states have adopted them, so we have, we have a record to look at. Um, and several states have now rescinded those because, quite frankly, people don't, don't do them. And so it, it, it really sounds good. Uh, Maine, they put it before the voters. It was polling. They said 90% before, but it was defeated. Only 48% of people actually voted for it and failed. So I would just ask you to take a look at both those issues closely in the next session as we're discussed. So thanks for Thank allowing me to speak with you. Well, your wisdom is always highly valued. Yeah. And uh, it's an honor to <coughs> be one of the people that has followed you in the Senate and uh, to uh, appreciate you and be able to express my appreciation for what you do to look out for the taxpayers of our district. And I thank you very much. Well, I mean, not to suck up too much, but we, we do have a great delegation here. And I appreciate your yeah. voting record. I appreciate you standing on principle time and time again. And so I am very one happy constituent of all of you. Thank you. Well, I, you know, it's it's been a tough week. We've had several younger people <coughs> Die, and you know, that I've had calls of people leaving that were younger than me, and it really has reminded me we need to thank some people for, you know, when we, as long as we have each other, because it's the brevity of life. And so I'm not wishing any bad luck on the way home, but uh, I just want to make sure that uh, if something happens to me, remember I did thank you. <laughs> And with that uh, bit of entertainment, the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>